and okay. I am clicking going live. And some folks might even hear this right now too. Hello everyone. Welcome to our program this evening. I am Stephanie Gaspar on the board of Kissimmee Valley Audubon Society and appreciate everyone watching. Next month is the last program of the season, so be sure to watch. We also have Jeannie Donahue, our president, attending on the panel. Stay up to date on chapter activities through Facebook and our website. If you're not on our mailing list, please reach out so we can add you. If you haven't seen any of our previous programs before, you can watch them on our YouTube channel. Before we begin, I would like to mention a few housekeeping items. For today's program, log in to YouTube and type any questions you have in the chat. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If we have any connection problems, please be assured that we will work on fixing it as soon as possible. I am happy to introduce tonight's guest, Matt Moore. He is a mostly self-taught artist living in Orlando, Florida, and has been drawing and painting since his childhood in Massachusetts. Art is an outlet for him to connect with things that have captured his imagination. Wildlife has always been a source of exhilaration for him, from seeing a raccoon or neighborhood bird to glancing to the side of the road in Namibia and seeing a herd of elephants foraging along the tree line. The tranquility he feels when he enjoys the beauty of the natural world and its creatures is something that he's compelled to communicate through painting. He feels that his art is sharing the feeling of happiness. His painting is realistic in nature, but his aim is to use paint colors, textures, and brush strokes to communicate the emotions behind the painting subject. He will show us many of his wildlife paintings and explain the stories behind them during his presentation. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, Matt. I will now pass it over to you. Good to go. Good to okay, go. Cool. Great. Thank you. Well, I appreciate your hosting me this evening. It's it's good to be here. As mentioned, my name is Matt Moore, as you see from the uh, introduction and in our slide here. And the theme of this presentation is how I enjoy nature with art, and you can too. Of course, everybody who is involved that I've met with Audubon is certainly a bird lever at the very least, and enjoys the outside living here in florida love florida it's certainly a, a state full of the full of wildlife and um just want to stop this the uh, slide there for a minute and talk uh introduction wise so i had a nice introduction there by stephanie uh currently i i do I'm a regular painter i've been painting as mentioned my whole life it's uh, still have a day job as well uh, just to give you a kind of a little background there I work in the design and engineering business, so it's a little little related. There's some creativity involved in it. I, I do work a lot. For, most of my work is for Disney and Universal. In fact, uh, much of it has to do with uh, design and engineering of carts, kiosks, and other uh, sometimes fiberglass sculptures and all sorts of things like that. So it's interesting. But my passion is painting. I always found it. It's very exciting to see wildlife, but not necessarily easy, that's for sure. Anything I had a fascination with, I always wanted to draw, including and especially birds. Wading and raptors really have become my favorite. I, I fell in love with spoonbills, actually, when I moved to the state of Florida. As mentioned, I'm from New England. They don't have spoonbills there. Um, Nature, it's it's pretty up there, but the the kind of abundance of all different cr critters like we have in Florida, it's it's not like that there in the Northeast that I can remember. Uh, so it was very thrilling to come here, which I did. I moved, it's been basically half my life here now, but moving here, uh, seeing even seeing the egrets and the herons was such a thrill. Uh, alligators, I, find, I have found exciting. When I saw the spoonbill, that was kind of became my favorite bird. I think because it's so exotic. Um, it's such an unusual color shape, and they're not they're not abundantly everywhere. You got to go kind of go look and try and find them. So that was something that I just um, latched onto. It seems like humans have always had an appreciation for birds, maybe because they fly. 
I mean, what else flies besides well, insects? But nothing quite like a like a bird. And if you go back in time, I've, I've analyzed this myself. Um, think of how much I enjoy it. Uh, you go back in time, and I'm going to get my slide here again. Let's see if I can. Stick on. There we go. Um, what I have here is a slide you may recognize, kind of the style of it, but it's a slide from ancient Egypt. I think that people have always liked, appreciated birds, not just for their ability to fly, but also when you think about it, they have such a, a large variety. I mean, you have all the way from a hummingbird, tiny little bird, all the way up to this giant ostrich. All the different shapes and sizes, not to mention the abundance of colors, which is one of the things that's nice about living in Florida. You have really quite a wide variety of here. here. But uh, also just thinking uh, uh, around the world of different birds. I was watching something recently about the great hornbill. What a, what a beautiful, incredible species that is. So you think of, of birds all over the world, uh, and then you think of parrots and all, all that family of birds, just the amazing variety of shapes, sizes, colors. It definitely sparks the imagination. And I think going back to Egypt, this is kind of a, looks like a, would, what would be a tomb picture. And this isn't, uh, this is just more of an everyday life thing you'd see maybe along the Nile River. Looks like ducks and geese when you see the lotus flowers. So th this inspired the ancient Egyptians thousands of years ago, maybe as far as, far as 3,000 years ago or more, the Egyptians were inspired. And they did a really nice job, I think, myself, with birds in art. You, you look at these, you can clearly recognize the type of birds they are. You see the duck, and it looks like there's an egret or a heron over there on the left side. And so they did a really nice job of capturing the, the, the look and the feel of birds, even in action. They weren't just sitting there either. You notice the ducks are flying. It's really, really incredible. And then, of course, they, they worshipped uh, gods that had animal-like features and birds, like the one god, I think it was Thoth, had the ibis head. Another Horus had a falcon for its head. Um, so they appreciated birds, even incorporated them in their worship. So fast-forwarding through time, and of course there was other peoples that would include birds, but I think the Egyptians are outstanding. That's just my opinion, think of what it's worth. Uh, but bringing it down to modern day, uh, more closer to modern day, and then the interesting tie-in to to the fact that we're associating here with the Audubon Society, in this case, Kissimmee Valley, but Audubon Society is named after John James Audubon. So there's a, a portrait of him. He, in my mind, is certainly would take some credit for being the father one of the fathers of probably more modern wildlife art. And what an interesting man he was. What a dynamic person. He was born in the late 1700s. And he um, was born in Haiti to a French father. And he ended up in Pennsylvania. And at some point, he decided he was going to go out. And at some point, we're talking early 1800s, when a lot of the, a lot of the, this, in North America was wild. And he was going to travel North America, and he was going to document the birds of North America. What an undertaking, thinking of the fact that he had a vehicle. He's sitting next to the vehicle there. It would be on his right or left. It's a horse. Uh, he went from Nova Scotia all the way out, um, I've read, to as far as almost Yellowstone, and down into South Florida, traveling to to see all the different bird species of North America. And of course, we're familiar with many of his paintings. He did some really, really remarkable work. Um, I, I personally like some better than others. Um, here's one of the ones I really like. I think, I believe this is an extinct species too. I think it's the Carolina parrot. That's either, I think it's the Carolina parakeet or the parrot. They, they're no longer in existence. But this is a part of one of the paintings here. It's got such a nice design to it, colorful. I like the way the birds are posed. Uh, one of my favorites. And then I had to pick this one just because it was a spoonbill. Um, so just imagine him and his, he had some helpers, but traveling all over the United States, what's now the United States, in that rough way, weeks on end, seeking out these species of birds. You'd have to think there was probably a little more abundant and a lot less people. So it might have been easier to find some of these species than it is now. 
but no doubt took a lot of work. From what I what I've read about his process, actually involved he'd find these birds and he would actually, and I know this is upsetting to some, but he would actually kill the bird he was going to use as his specimen. Um, so that was sad. Uh, most of his, and he did like 400 birds uh, overall. And then he did some mammals as well. But most of his, his specimens he did um, kill. He hunted them down and killed them. And he had an interesting thing he would do. He would actually pose them with strings and wire. He would get them set up in a pose he thought worked. And you can really appreciate the detail like here when you look at the feathers and the wings especially. Uh, I think he was, personally, I feel like he was really strong in the details of feather, the shape of the birds. I, it's funny that he would pose them, he would shoot them, and he would pose them. And um, if shooting was, I don't, I don't actually know how he did away with them, but couldn't have shot him. You had to be careful they could destroy it. So I don't know exactly how that worked. But anyways, he had a dead bird, and you can kind of, some of his poses are a little odd, I think. They're, they're not his, his strongest part, especially the bigger birds, because he set out to paint all birds' actual size. And he had these large pieces of paper, uh, two foot by three foot, I think it was, which is a big piece of paper. And he sought to fit the entire bird on a page. So that's why you'll see things like a flamingo and a heron, uh, like the great blue heron. It's in a funny pose because he had to get the neck down to kind of, they're always in that feeding pose for them because he couldn't have it standing up. It wouldn't fit on his paper. Uh, so that was an interesting tidbit there. So it, you have to appreciate the tremendous effort that he made to, to document hundreds of birds uh, to catch them. You know, he had, there was no photography, keep in mind, zero photography. So he wanted to be super accurate. Um, I can testify, as I'm sure uh, you, you've you noted, it's hard to sit with a sketch pad and try and do a picture of a bird, especially the small, quick ones. They they move fast. Details are tough. Fortunately, spoonbills, are, they like to kind of wade and they'll stand there. And you could sketch them realistically, but um, in person. But yeah, we have uh, photography now, which is a blessing for um, people like me. I, I just FYI, as far as my process, I'll talk more about that in a minute, but as far as my process goes, I definitely love to take photographs and use photographs gen uh, uh, for for the detail. I'm not really a photographic copyist because I don't, I don't think a lot of the actual photographs actually make great paintings. It's interesting. I think they're useful to help get detail, but not necessarily something you want to copy every little part of. So they're great for, they serve their purpose. Let's put it that way, uh, for documentation. Anyways, John James Audubon did not have that. So that was half of, that was really only half maybe of his task. And maybe that was the most enjoyable part for him. Many of us who do paintings, uh, as those who listen may attest to, uh, yes, there's some work involved, but that's the part we really enjoy. But what he did that was really special and unique besides that is he didn't just roll these things up or hang them on a wall and we never would have heard of them, heard from of his paintings or him. He actually was maybe a better marketer and a salesman than he was an artist. And that's why we know about him because he traveled around and marketed his art. And he ended up getting these printed into a couple, at least 200, I, I believe it's 200 volumes or 200 sets of four volumes each, I believe is the number of these things. So you picture these giant books that come in sets of four uh, or eight, I forget, forget which one it is, but it's a bunch of volumes of these huge books because the sheets are gigantic. And, and the other thing about that is that Keep in mind, there was no photo type setting or any of that. This all had to be hand engraved and colorized for all these. So it's painstaking process to get these in color. And so they were expensive even for their day. But he managed to promote this and get a lot of attention and interest in his art. And as a result, in the birds, which was fascinating. And really, that's why we know about him, because he put that effort forth. I think there's kind of a, a misconception for people uh, who think that somebody, just because they're a great artist, people just know about them just because they're so good that people just find out. And that's that's really not true. Um, in fact, even people like Van Gogh, uh, who is so famous and so well-known and so loved today, wasn't in his own time. He actually personally was a horrible marketer. 
He was not good at sharing his work. He didn't honestly didn't care. He want, he would love to have had more money probably, but he did not want to spend time talking to people about that stuff. He wanted to paint. And so he wasn't good. His brother owned a gallery, and you would think that was helpful. But then his brother Theo, uh, he died, and then his brother Theo died not long after. And I think he might have been in one show. It wasn't much. Uh, the person who really deserves, I believe, like uh, maybe a lion's share of the credit for our, our modern day appreciation, or at least initiating it, our modern day appreciation of Van Gogh's art was actually his sister in law, Theo's wife, who got possession of all Van Gogh's paintings and ended up just, I wish I had her as a salesperson because she killed it. Obviously, his paintings now are worth millions. And, and interestingly, uh, uh, there are several there's several volumes of Audubon books still original prints still out there, and recently I saw one of the full sets sold for eight million dollars. So um, they have a high value. You can see why all the effort that went into them and prints. You can still get the prints like this. You can look up Audubon prints, and if you want one, you can get one. They're still there and they're popular to some degree. But you have to uh, you have to admire Audubon's effort to promote something that he was passionate about. That's kind of my point. Um, in reaching out to people that appreciate my subject matter, which is wildlife and birds, just to acquaint, just to get acquainted with people that are passionate about the same subject I am. So that's Audubon. Um, bringing it forward from there, I have this slide because I think that part of the enjoyment of nature with art is doing it. Certainly, we'll talk about that. Doing it is a big part of it, but uh, whether you're a really you have a lot of talent, you've been at it for a long time, or you just like to doodle, or maybe you're just starting out, it's a great way to enjoy nature. It's a it's a perfect way to relax. It's very serene. You can listen to your favorite music. You can do some painting. But the reason I have this slide is because another great way to enjoy nature through art is these wonderful wildlife artists. Many of you may be familiar with. Uh, with some, maybe you have a favorite. I put some of my favorite. I tend toward the uh, more the realistic, I guess you'd say, kind of artwork. Um, doesn't have to be. I mean, it's, it's just my taste I'm showing because it's a little in line with my style. Most of these are more towards my style than others. But whimsical is great too. I mean, certainly you can honor uh, and enjoy nature with more whimsical creations, whatever that might be, or sculpture. Uh, but anyways, what I have here, uh, the chickadees are Robert Bateman, who's a tremendous, tremendous artist. Uh, what I, I what I, my takeaway, I love his style. And I, he has, like so many of these artists do, kind of the composition actually forms some interesting abstract shapes, although it itself is very realistic. Here in the case of Robert Bateman, you have a simple muted background. It doesn't confuse the, 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 the subject, comes right to the front, but it's kind of an X shape. An abstract X shape crossing the the canvas there, really interesting, like a lot of his paintings are. But what I like about Robert Bateman besides that is that he um, he does not he's not limited. Like some people are very focused on birds because they're and they're happy to be, and it's fine, nothing wrong with that. Maybe even a couple species of birds. Others are maybe only certain kind of wildlife. Uh, maybe it's animals of the west or some just do african wildlife but bateman traveled all over the world he would do things from he would do a penguin he then he'd be up and he would uh, have a moose from alaska he would have a tiger from india african animals and did a beautiful job really with all of them so if you have heard of robert bateman and admire his work i'm in agreement with you and if you have not heard of him i would and you have an interest in wildlife art at all i would certainly suggest uh, checking out some of his beautiful beautiful artwork I also have in the middle there the bighorn sheep, and that is another gorgeous composition. How your eye is led through this picture, uh, some, of, and that's really the masterfulness of some of these great uh, artists. Um, but that's Carl Rungis, who was lived in the late 1800s, I think, in into about the middle of the 20th century. Came from Germany, fell in love with especially the art of the Rocky Mountains, or not the art, but the animals of the Rocky Mountains. Was an avid hunter himself, but he liked to paint, obviously. And he would get up in these remote, remote areas in the early 20th century as an adult. And just, uh, I don't know how much he used photography. Uh, he probably did a lot of field sketching, I believe. But brilliant artist, 
Not not too much of a bird guy, I have to say. But if you like wildlife art, I think Carl Runges, you can't ignore him. He's amazing. So you'll, you'll have a deeper appreciation for bighorn sheep, elk, bison, moose, deer, kind of the big game of the American West. And he paints it in a way that really honors it, which is something that's important to me. I, I like to kind of glor- glorify um, animals highlight the beauty of them because they, that's what they are. They're beautiful what birds and uh, animals, gorgeous. The other thing that's kind of a, off the beaten path in this particular, that's a, a piece of wildlife art is this um, one on the top right, which is Charlie Harper. Maybe you've heard of Charlie Harper. He is uh, did all wildlife, but it's of this kind of style, geometric shapes, very graphic in nature. Really, I think very different, unusual, interesting, did all kinds of animals and birds, Charlie Harper. Uh, check them out. Great artist, beautiful work. Then down bottom left is Bob uh, Robert Kuhn, who had a really great textural style. Um, he did the bears, the Kodiak bear eating a fish with the seagulls looking on. So he included some birds, but he was kind of a big game person, did, did the big cats as well, and was another one of these people that was not limited to one continent or type of animal or species. He was all across the board doing a beautiful job. Really painterly. Uh, textural type effects compared to the upper left Bateman tighter, uh, tighter with the brush strokes and so forth. And he had a nice loose Jaidmeyer, the loose uh, approach. The middle is someone that probably kind of got me excited. The middle bottoms is someone that got got me excited about wildlife art as a kid. My parents got this book by a guy named Glenn Lotz back in the late seventies, early eighties, and he did a lot of these creatures like this owl, really super detailed on a white background and somehow uh, just on the white background really just enables you to focus on it. Still a very nice competition, a composition with the the branch and the needles, the pine foliage behind it, great horned owl. Um, So that was a long time ago. Not sure what his status is, but another interesting style that just captures the imagination for me. And then bottom right, that's, that's a man who's alive, older, my father's age, Tucker Smith is his name. Western type artist, um, by, beautiful bison pictures. You can see with the mountains in the background, ominous clouds, and beautiful, beautiful uh, sage bushes at the bottom, sagebrush. So, not all birds, but I know Audubon lovers appreciate wildlife of all sorts. And um, I think I, I'm just enjoying sitting here looking at these and describing them, to be honest with you. And I think that. If you want to enjoy nature through art and haven't given it a shot, get a book at the library or even just search some of these artists online and just sit back and enjoy. Enjoy the views of these beautiful paintings and you'll find ones that you like as your favorite. Um, I have to put a plug in here for this place. Um, I don't know if any have been there, but it's in Jackson, Wyoming, which is one of my spots I have come to love very much. But it's the National Museum of Wildlife Art. And it features some of the artists that we just looked at some of the paintings of. It's a beautiful place. It's got some great sculptures to the left and the right. They're not in this picture, but they have a, it's a sculpted herd of uh, elk on one side and a bison, a big bull bison with a, the females with them on the other side, full, full size, life size, uh, in a beautiful setting right there in um, Grand Teton National Park. So if you're headed out that way, if you ever, if you're inclined to go to Yellowstone or you're traveling through the West, and you like wildlife art, it's a must be place. Very well worth going there. Uh, see some of the best in the world when it comes to wildlife art. And certainly, uh, and I feel it's worth a plug to, to help you to enjoy nature through art, for sure. So that brings up the, the idea of how about creating nature art yourself? Well, there's quite a, a wide spectrum from those who are thinking about it uh, maybe doodle a little bit, but don't feel too confident about it. Maybe don't think they can do very well to those who are very proficient and have been uh, longtime artists. Um, but something that we enjoy hearing what other people have to to say and learn about there. Everybody's got kind of their own approach, I think. So this is mine. I have to mention that it's not, it's certainly not by any stretch the only, um, the only, the only way, more than one way to do it is what I'm trying to say. So as I mentioned before, this slide kind of shows, these are some pictures I personally have taken. One, I, I enjoy going places and 
just looking at um, looking for and looking at the wildlife. These are um, these are from a couple spots here in Central Florida, going you know, kind of more towards the Orlando area. Um, the the a Lake Apopka Wildlife Loop. I don't know if anybody has been to that, but that is a great place to go to see all kinds of birds and alligators. A lot of alligators. Huh? That's, if you want to see alligators, that's the place to go. Um, also, you have the spoonbills there. That is from um, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, which is a favorite of mine. Uh, it's a great place to see spoonbills certain times of year, as is the white pelican and I think the great blue heron. But the point is, it's a, a. I think photography is a great way to get yourself some reference material, but also to experience, experience the habitat. Maybe sometimes you can take notes along with it as well, and just drink in the feeling you get. Uh, I, I know that I, there's been times I've admired an animal or a bird, and I, even to this day, it's it's that way because I haven't certainly haven't seen everything, and I want I just want to paint it. And I see pictures and I'm inspired. Or I watch a Disney. A wildlife video or one of these videos that's um, kind of a wildlife thing. And I see a bird I haven't seen and I want to paint it because it's so beautiful. So I'll find reference materials, which in my mind, nothing wrong with using. I mean, if I can take a great picture. There's a million pictures that are a hundred times better than the reality is. But I think part of the taking pictures yourself helps you to um, get the feeling of how the bird or the animal how they live and kind of what their habitat. My point that I was trying to make is when you go and you're actually there and the creature is right there, the animal or the bird is right there, it's often different than the feeling or the thought you had before. It's a whole different spectrum that gets open to you. I, I have found that especially with, um, especially with some of the big ma mammals. Um, I, I, w I was able to go to Africa and it's one thing to draw or paint an elephant and you can do it, but when you go there and you actually see an elephant or you see an ostrich, I saw an ostrich talking about birds with its babies in Namibia. Um, it's it's really a different experience and it's a different feeling. And that comes into your artwork, I think. So it's good to experience, good to use photographs. Um, as far as the process is concerned, I like to bird watch. I'm going to uh, stop the screen share just for a moment. There we go. I like to, to bird watch myself. And the beauty of birds is you can do that right in your own backyard, as many of us do. Uh, probably all of us have, have or have had bird feeders. And it's amazing the spectrum of wild birds that come to your backyard. I was been surprised because I pay a lot of attention to it. I've been paying more attention personally to the smaller birds a lot. But I had a painted bunting in my yard two years in a row, which was awesome. And I live... In downtown Orlando. I mean, I don't live on the outskirts. I live, you can walk to the downtown from here. So it's in the city. Um, there's interesting things around the city. I mean, it's Florida. So we've got you know, people putting on the neighborhood app pictures of um, coyotes and also otters, river otters. Uh, but we've got owls. I, in the morning, often I hear a screech owl, eastern screech owl in the morning, uh, right here in the neighborhood. Like I said, it's downtown. Lots of in the in the lakes. There's herons and um, we get sandhill cranes. Right now, lately, it's been really super exciting. Is we have and it's actually at uh, Mead Gardens, not too far away, is the nest. But we have um, swallow-tailed kites, which is awesome. It's a beautiful bird as well, unmistakable for the tail, but gorgeous bird that's white and black. So the point is that right here in our own little backyard, we don't have to travel to some exotic place to see wild birds. You can see them right here, and it's great. And I take pictures. I just quiet about it, but I take pictures and sketch right in my yard. I love to see. It's a thrill to even see it. I've seen a million cardinals, as I'm sure you have as well. But it's still exciting to see them. Blue jays as well. Um, the, the one thing I had in the neighborhood that was odd is brown bird, but I haven't seen him again. It was a brown thrasher. The brown thrasher landed on the fence one day. That was cool. But we've got um, got the Carolina wrens. Someone at the last, I did a, an Audubon talk in person in Space Coast last month, and somebody told me about this Merlin app, uh, the bird app with Merlin that will, if you pay for it, you got to pay, but this is free for a little while, but it, it listens, all right? You know about that. It listens and it'll tell you what you're hearing. That's an eye opener. You know, then you can start looking around. Wait a second. We have one of those around here. 
So you got you can look around. And I came home from work the other day, and there was a little uh, palm warbler in the front yard hopping around. And I managed to run in, grab my camera, go out and take some really great shots of them. So hopefully, um, my my for me my point. I'm always thinking of some way I can try and use this reference material in a like a composition and come up with something really cool. I think the little birds are hard. The birds actually not so much the hard part, but com composing it in a way that doesn't distract from the bird that's challenging. So you got to really do a really nice job with twigs, sticks, and branches and leaves. So it's tricky. I'm working on that one, but um, that's an excellent way to you know to dive into to nature art yourself is drawing and sketching and taking some pictures right in your own backyard, right in your yard. You don't have to leave. If you're in Florida, you've got it somewhere. I know Jeannie has. Uh, was telling me about her situation where she said spoonbills in the backyard, right? Yeah, so um, yeah, it's uh, it's a great way to acquaint yourself with nature. I wish I had spoonbills in the backyard. That I'm probably not going to see. We don't have water right here, but um, anyways, taking pictures is good. I believe in it. I think for birds especially, it's hard to try and sketch the bird and capture all the, the detail you need. I mean, Audubon realized that so start with bird watching, schedule schedule some time to relax, sit quietly to watch and listen and just drink in the ambiance of the situation. I mean, think how relaxing that is, you know, to take a break from work or whatever else you got on got going on to relax and just serenely enjoy nature, thinking of maybe a way that you can translate that into some artwork of your own, whether you're, you can start with sketching would certainly be the easiest place to go. I think painting is at another level because now we're talking about uh, adding colors, lights, darks, you know, shade, all this mixing paints and all that. Which which medium you're going to try? Do I do watercolor? Do I do acrylic, oil? What am I going to do? A lot of people like to start with acrylic, I think. Um, seems to me in the discussions I have with people, that's where they like to go. Uh, but any of them can be good, but more challenging, I think, than just, then I shouldn't say just, but then drawing and sketching. It's a great place to start. And you'll get, I think, more quicker rewards, I would say. And if you're new to it, I would suggest, Try and see the, the bird as a series of shapes. Get the form and try and get the proportions right uh, is a great place to start. And photos can help, really. It can help you get details, which is why I really like to take them. Favorite spots besides my own backyard. I mentioned a couple. Black Point Preserve in Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. Awesome. St. Augustine Alligator Farm. I don't know if any of you have been there, but. If you like, they have a rookery there. It's pretty cool for the alligators, but they have a rookery there where wild birds come in and they have spoonbills. And it's coming up to April, May. They'll have little spoonbills that you, you can look in on the nest from their boardwalk. Um, so worth a visit. And besides that, they got egrets and uh, herons and all that kind of stuff and uh, wood storks and so forth. Um, Mead Gardens here in town is nice. I can walk there practically. Lake Apopka Wildlife Loop is another one. Of course, I think any beach in Florida is great for, for birds. I, the, I got some of my best bird pictures, and a nice painting was uh, just the white ibises kind of feeding in the beach in the morning. So that's terrific. And then just the little shorebirds. And if you get a brown pelican, for some reason I find the brown pelican more exciting than the white. It's just my opinion. I think they're kind of colorful. I like it. But that's a great shorebird as well. So you do that. You, you take your camera, do a little sketching, just relax and enjoy it. And drink in the experience. I think time of day, if you're thinking about it, you're serious about it, you want to get some paint on a piece of paper. I think that for reference material, the best time to take pictures is probably in the morning or in the evening, what they call the golden hour, which many of you may be familiar with. But it's the time when the sun is up, but it's getting down low on the horizon. And because of the angle of the rays of light, the, the, they tend to take on kind of an orangey, rosy kind of a hue. And the shadows tend to be reflective of the sky, especially if it's been a sunny day. You get really brilliant, brilliant bluish purple, just gorgeous shadows. So it ends up being very dramatic. And you'll notice a lot of art features that. You get dramatic sh sh uh, shadows. So great time to take pictures and to sketch. Is in the evening or in the morning when you get a nice sunny day with us when the when the rays of the sun are long. Uh, so just a recommendation there. I uh, often for me, I, I'm a person that tends to include and want to put details of surrounding uh, the surrounding area. So 
trees, bushes, and so forth. Sketch it. Then, then what I do is I try and go home in a relaxed time of day, and I try and come up with an idea based on some scene I've had, but I try and compose, make a composition. Composition is a whole other discussion. This isn't an art lesson. So I'm not going to bore you with that kind of stuff, but composition is a big deal. It makes the difference between just a picture and something that really captures the imagination. So for me, sketching and coming up with something, and that's why photographs don't do it for me a lot, because you have no control over what. You have some, but whatever you've got in front of you, that's your composition. But with the painting, you can move things where you want. So it, it takes uh, precedence to me in that way. Also, if you're going to paint or draw, Good draftsmanship is an essential part of a successful piece of wildlife art. Realistic. And if you're more whimsical, probably doesn't matter as much. But I'm speaking from the perspective of this kind of stuff here that I have, where it's um, like uh, the turkeys, painted bunting from the yard, egrets. Um, it, it, if you're going to make it look real, the, dra the drawing, you got to get the proportions right. Otherwise, people, even the most untrained eye, is not. I'm saying we see people see things they know what they're looking at they know but looks weird so um the better drawing you, you're you have and the better your piece of artwork will be and that is a matter of practice so as far as paint is concerned each has desirable properties whether it's watercolor oil acrylic um you just have to kind of decide what look you like because they're very different. These are all, this is all oil paintings. I do a lot of decent amount of watercolors too. It's got a really a whole different look to it, as, as you may re realize. Uh, it's different, but it's both, both beautiful in their own way. So I'm kind of using up all my time, I think, um, getting carried away. I can talk about forever. But, anyways, just one point I wanted to make about art and conservation. I believe that beautiful wildlife art is a catalyst for conservation in a number of ways. One, it increases the awareness of and appreciation for wildlife when we take the time uh, to look at it. No doubt about it. You know, if you have it on your home and your wall, or you're admiring it in a museum. I mean, you're gonna. It, how exciting if you see a picture of something or painting that someone's done so well. It makes you appreciate it. Makes, I always feel that way. And then when I see that particular bird or an animal, I, I'm more excited about it. And I care more about it. It's not just this thing darting around out, out in the sky, but it's a it's a unique species. And some artist has helped me to appreciate that. So I think, at the very least, art uh, can be can really help the conservation effort. So, also, I had the question: How can environmental art support the uh, wildlife? Conserva conservation, well, it reminds us of our love of nature and wildlife. It enhances our respect and our relationship with the natural world. And it brings people together around an environmental cause. Appreciation and love for wildlife art equals respect and care for wildlife and nature. So overall, I think wildlife art is a beautiful thing. And it's a good thing. I'm glad to be able to talk about it. Whether you feel you have artistic talent or not, it doesn't really matter. You can still enjoy. Uh, in a lot of sense, you put the practice in, you'll be surprised at how far you can make the progress. A lot of it's about practice. You, you know, we're not all trying to be the next Robert Bateman or the next John James Audubon. We're just trying to enjoy something, and that's okay. Um, don't get frustrated. Spend your quiet time outside enjoying the environment. Sketch, paint, and be creative. Start by taking a sketch pad and pencil with you on your next outing. So that's my feel on this topic. I very much appreciate your watching and listening this evening. Um, oh, I did have some of my own paintings I wanted to include. I kind of lost track of that. Sorry about that. I'll bring it up. Let's see. There we go. So this is some very, this is a, a few that I picked. Egrets, heron, scrub jay from a recent visit to the Crookshank Sanctuary, you may be aware of in Rockledge, blue heron, and then the interesting hooded merganser, really cool duck type bird with a very unusual, kind of has racing stripes male, and he's got that unusual head. And then just a kind of a sunset scene with some snowy egrets inspired by Florida in general. It doesn't take long. You don't have to go far to see sites like that. But I like to really get the unique features of each bird. 
species, hopefully doing some kind of activity like the herons building a nest that was from Lake Apopka, um, or foraging around like the snowy egrets. So I appreciate your watching and listening. You can maintain a connection with me if you're interested by following on Instagram at more wildlife art, M O O R E W I L D L I F E A R T on Instagram. I also invo invite you to join my join my private email list. Each month I send out an update on the latest wildlife paintings from inside the studio. Anyone who would like to join my list is welcome. And if you send me a note, uh, you can do that by going to my website, which is noted here, morewildlifeart.com. You send me a note that you heard this presentation, and I'll send you a, an appreciation for following. I will um, send you a digital image of one of my paintings. Hopefully that is an incentive. So thank you again for listening. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thanks to Lake Kissimmee Audubon and Jeannie Donovan, our Lake Kissimmee Audubon Society president and artist as well. That's it. Any questions, comments? Stephanie? Thank you so much, Matt. It was great just hearing you talk give some of the history of art share your favorite artists and talk about the process i think it's really important uh, for people to realize that you don't have to be this professional artist but you have you could start somewhere with the sketching and just being out in nature i think that's really fun and i yeah, do have okay. questions <laughs> Okay, hopefully I have answers. Thank you. Okay. So uh, going back to the very beginning, you mentioned how you've worked, uh, you've done work for Disney and Universal. Have you done any art work for them? I guess that depends on what you consider artwork. Yeah, in one form or a fashion, but not not in paintings, though, not like this, not like animal art. It's been more it's more to what their needs are than what my my thing is, you know. Yeah, but there's definitely some creativity. I I have dabbled over the years in many creative outlets, including graphic design and Stein design and all that sort of thing. So that's more probably the end of where it might be. Um, even as recently as uh, Spring Universal, they have a a a, a part of the their park they're changing over to the despicable me minion theme and there was uh, there's a sculpture they're putting a restaurant in there i don't want to give secrets away too much but there's a sculpture and there was some uh some couple features of the sculpture that were needed to be flushed out so i used some create creativity to come up with an idea for that which what which ended up being 3d printed into some parts for this sculpture um not of the minions themselves but of some robot parts and stuff and stuff so you never know where creativity can and creative thinking can lead you, but it's fun. And and by the way, I didn't really talk about that because it's not part of that, but uh, dabbling around with things like 3D printing and having things 3D CNC'd is part of my life over there in that end of things. And it's, it's an interesting creative outlet. Absolutely, very fun. All right, I have another question. When you started to talk about Robert Bateman, I thought it was really interesting and I'm, and haven't really taken art classes before. So I didn't realize uh, how you mentioned he uses that X shaped, uh, I guess, mm, he uses that X shape for his composition. It's, it's, it's design, yeah. Yes. And do you find that to be common with a lot of artists or is that just Robert Bateman? Well, I think most, I think all successful realistic and actually it doesn't doesn't have to be realistic it doesn't really matter because you, even if you're doing abstract painting like if you're, if you're doing cubism or you're in like casso mode or you know even um the guy over on tamba with the curly mustache i can't think of his name oh dolly the, dolly that, that style of art still you're leading you're, you're still wanting to lead a person's eye through the painting and you want it to be you know somehow telling a story, getting interest. So there's the X shape is one way to do it. There's quite a few different methods um, to do composition, but 
to answer your question, uh, no, Robert Bateman is definitely not the only one. He just does it well. In my mind, I like the way he does it. It's kind of spectacular because, I mean, I have compositions too, but it's not it's not Robert Bateman comp composition, I don't think. Um, he's just really good at it and someone to aspire to, mm -hmm. if that answers your question. Yes, absolutely. All right, another question. So I know you've been to Namibia, but have you been to any other African countries or other places around the world for wildlife art with the sole purpose of art or are you traveling for other reasons? Yeah, I've been a couple other places. That's really the outside the country spot I've been for wildlife art. I've traveled to Europe, but it wasn't really for wildlife art. It was London and France and London and Paris. And that actually was inspired, though, by uh, by seeing the chateaus in the Loire Valley, which I highly recommend if you're, you get a chance because it's like traveling into the uh, Cinderella movie, but it's real. But anyways, to, to answer your question, the places I've been, not outside the country, but here, went to Alaska, which is amazing. We we actually, it was really cool. We One of the first things we did in Alaska was take a trip from Anchorage to Katmai, which is near the uh, Kenai Peninsula, or no, that was the boat trip. Anyways, Katmai is where Brooks Falls is. Brooks Falls is where the bears stand on top of the rocks and the salmon jump and they catch yes. them. So actually being there was incredible. Got some great photographs, uh, bears walking within several feet of us, huge Kodiak bears. Wow. Um, it's an amazing place. Took two small planes to get there. The second one, I sat next to the pilot uh, and we landed on the water. And it felt like landing in another land because there was it was just devoid. Of, it was like it was total nature, nature and fly fishermen and bears. Wow. <laughs> so, but it was amazing for the bears. And then we took this incredible uh, cruise at, at, in Seward there, and saw humpback whales. Um, I think finback whales, killer whales, seals, stellar sea lions, puffins. Um, sea, sea otters floating in the bay. If uh, see Jeannie's nodding her head, maybe she's done it. It's an amazing, it's an amazing trip for nature. It took a lot of a lot of good reference material. Um, so yeah, those are probably my oh no, and I sh I should mention my favorite place in this country at this point, which is for that sort of thing, which is Yellow, the Yellowstone Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which includes Yellowstone to the north and Grand Teton National Park to the south, which is about two hours south. Just went in September, hired a guy who does wildlife photography to take me around and help me find some of the species, some of the um, elk we saw. He he helped me to find, it. well, I went with him and he we came upon a couple of elk um, bulls because it was still the rut. And they were, it sounded like gunfire, but they were knocking heads. It was pretty cool. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. So a few places, yes. And I'm originally from New York, Long Island. So when I moved down here, like you, it was amazing to just see all the wildlife and birds because you just don't see certain things like that in Long Island. So uh, it's great where just in our backyards, we could just see these amazing things. And you mentioned brown thrasher, and I do get that in my yard, but they prefer a lot of leaf litter. So if people are raking a lot and there's not a lot of leaves, you won't really see them as much. But I hope that you could see them again because they have very striking eyes and especially how they mimic uh, other bird calls. It's pretty neat. It was a beautiful bird, striking. Yes. Okay, another question. Any artist or photographer that we have, I always must ask, which camera do you use? I use a Nikon P1000. It's not a, it's not a digital SLR. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty good point and shoot that's got a very long, long range. That's probably the advantage. So it's really great for zooming in on things. It does not have, it's not great for like in-flight pictures. Shutter speed is not fast enough, I would say, being honest. Um, but it's good for long distance. I've had a lot of success for one with birds that aren't moving too fast. <laughs> and then also, like I was saying, the mammals, like when I saw, I got some pictures of the elk battling and they were probably a quarter mile away and I got a decent picture. Hmm. We also, when we went to Yellowstone in 2019, I'll just mention this, they had, there was a, 
we came across this whole group of people watching the wolves. We got to see wolves and there was four of them harassing a, a lone bison um, cat, cow. And she had a baby and they got, they got the baby, which was a little sad. And the cow was trying to fight him off, but it was too late. There was like four wolves. Um, wow. So that was amazing. And that I say, I'm bringing it up because that was like a quarter mile away too. And I got decent pictures. So the, the long lens for wildlife is, is good. I'd recommend it. The, the camera, that camera is about a thousand bucks. So it's not the cheapest, but compared to the digital SLRs with the lenses, that's a drop in the bucket. Good to know. When it comes to your art, what is your favorite medium? Do you prefer watercolors or acrylics? Uh, do you have a preference? Um, hard to say. It's neck and neck. Let's see. What we have here actually is, is three watercolors and three oil paintings. The egret, the um, scrub jay, and the mergensers are watercolors, and the herons and the picture with the sunset or sunrise, are, those are oil. I've been doing a lot of oil lately. Uh, um, I had kind of grown up doing watercolor more because watercolor is clean, easy to get in and out of. It's not, you know, oil is oil. Once it's out of the tube, I mean, you can't, like with watercolor, you just add water and it's alive again. Oil, it only lasts so long, kind of messier. It's harder to clean up after. So I think that slows people down. But it's not as difficult and hard and, doesn't take as long to dry as everybody thinks either it's a nice it's a nice medium for beginners i would say too awesome so the answer is i don't either one i don't i don't really know which my favorite is. i like <laughs> them both great you mentioned the saint augustine alligator farm which i have not been to but have you been to uh gator land one of our local attractions uh, because yes Depending on the time of year, you can see all the birds uh, on the boardwalk, mm. some of the egrets nesting. So it's a great place. I, I see people uh, taking pictures, sketching, uh, but local for Kissimmee and Orlando folks. Yeah, it's a lot closer than St. Augustine. That's true. I think the big attraction for me, well, I love St. Augustine anyways, because it's got a lot to offer. But the big attraction for me is Spoonbills. Um, so that caught me. But yeah, I've been to Gatorland, and I mean, not not only do they have the na native birds there, the the what the uh, wading birds, but also they've got nice parrots there. They have a really nice flock of, I think they're you know American flamingos, I believe. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of good birds to see there for sure. Absolutely. Another question: If you are taking a picture first or deciding to paint. Uh, the image, do you ever include human structures or do you prefer just to have nature, like a house in the background or you do not want human structures? Well, yeah, I, I try typically to avoid human structures. I'm kind of, that's my thinking. I don't, I'm not anti-human structures, but I feel like, uh, like when I, when I'm interested in that, I do that, you know, and like, I, I have a painting I did of the, you know, a couple of pictures of the Chrysler building in New York city with people walking around it. Um, like I mentioned, even the trip when I went to the time I went to Europe and went to Paris and went to the Loire Valley, that was to see architecture and, um, some of the chateaus there were incredible. And I done, made some effort to paint those and like the Eiffel tower, but I feel like that's like one thing over here. And then the the birds and bison, I like to kind of keep it, like keep the humanity out of the picture, I guess. Yes, I completely understand. As for your work, do you sell any prints? Uh, can If people sign up for your newsletter, can they purchase prints? Or have you ever thought of putting together a calendar uh, that people can get i have thought of the calendar idea prints wise i i, I think I, I have one available on my print on my website right now um and it's really the first one i was i, I had attempted to do some through um society the society six they do um they do like you set you, you set up your artwork and they can print it on all kinds of things. You can print it on a clock, a t-shirt, a sweatshirt. Uh, you can have it printed and framed. And I have sold some that way. Um, so it, that's a work in progress. I actually have a really nice print place that does print for artists. Literally, I could walk to it down the street here. 
but I haven't put too much effort into the through my website doing the prints. Mostly trying at this point, I think I'm in the mode of trying to acquaint people with the artwork and get them to be interested in it to create the market to begin with. Um, once there's the interest or the market, I think that definitely prints are, would be a logical place to go. But I feel like I have to, I need to have some people that are interested in it first, you know, that makes sense. Yes. And then my final question, and then I'll pass it to Jeannie if she has any. I noticed on your work on the bottom right corner, usually you have your signature. And did it take you time to figure out what your signature would be every time? Yeah, it kind of morphed. I mean, it's close to the same thing. It's, it's some variety to it, but I kind of write, I kind of write my name that way. I would say, I would call that it's almost like an architectural style of lettering kind of stylized a little bit but since i do a lot of drafting and which doesn't include too many hand drawings but there is like a certain uh way of writing it kind of morphs from that and i thought it looked nice so it it, it did evolve over a long time i like how it looks <laughs> Jeannie, do you Thank have you. any questions oh you're muted Let me see if I can unmute you. Okay. I Am think I you're, you're you unmuted can. now. All righty. Well, well, first of all, thank you so much, Matthew. You did a beautiful job and your artwork is stunning. It's absolutely stunning. And well, I, thank I, you. I appreciate it. I appreciate also the way you, you encouraged our members and people who, are, who will view this. At, you know forever probably youtube is probably forever so um you probably in, encourage generations of people for your for from your artwork and I, I do appreciate that um on a personal note uh it, what, what's the name of that print shop down the street from you um art art rd art i think is what it's called <laughs> rd art something like that yeah it's kind of a weird name let me check it i'll look you want to make it, but if you want to get, they have a website you can upload. You, you don't have to come to Orlando necessarily because they're right here on Fern Creek. I live okay. on Fern Creek. We're right off of Fern Creek near downtown. I don't know if are you familiar with Orlando pretty much. Are you familiar with the Orlando area, Jeannie? Oh, yeah. I, 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 actually, I, I worked for a company like Matt. I worked uh, for a special effect company. Uh, 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 for a long time, for seven years, for uh, we built lots of the Harry Potter special effects. Worked a lot of Disney special effects. Mm. We built the the equipment that made the mummy. Uh, you know, do the the. What, the what company was that? Pardon. What company was that? Uh, it was uh, Backstage Technologies. I think I've heard of it. Yeah, it was, it, you know that theming. I work in the in on the theming side of things with the theme parks. It's not a huge, you know. It's no, not a huge. I used to work for the Nassau company. I don't know if you're familiar with. Oh that, yeah, but. Nassau. Uh, do do you uh, uh, remember uh, by any chance uh, uh, Richard Crane Productions? Name sounds familiar. Yeah, he, he was a. It was, it was some time ago. That's a, about when we got here. About 25 years ago, we started working with him. I did some storyboard artwork for him. Uh, when I was with Backstage Technology, I was there uh, on on. Uh, the, the, their in-house graphic artist did, did a lot of 3D printing for the for different things and uh, so anyway I, I I respect you having to work for, work for Universal and Disney that they're they're not easy to work for but they're no. quite demanding but uh, it's, they are uh, yep they got the big bag of money though oh yes they do we we called uh, Universal uh, Mordor. <laughs> That was our nickname yeah. for Mordor. <laughs> yeah, and you know, out of, I I could share opinions with you out of the, the bottom, but you know, overall, yeah. I have, I have yeah, my yeah. official word is I very much appreciate them because they, um, they, you know, they 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 offer the work that's unique that wouldn't be there if it wasn't for them. Exactly, exactly. They 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 do a fine job, and and we're we're lucky to have them. That's for sure. So, 
Uh, yeah. 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 Just get to get back to your question. The name of that um, print shop is Art Art Arty Art, and it's spelled R T. It's R T, like the letter R, the letter T, and then A R T. Okay. And their their website is rt art dot com. All right, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to get prints made, they're the guys who can do it for sure. That that'd be nice. I I think that's a that's a nice way to make money if you can't sell your 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 larger paintings. Uh, you know, as long so, as, yeah, yeah. If you can keep your copyright on them, that's that's what you need to do. Yeah, I, I think as far as the 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 paintings are. It's a certain level of what people can afford. And then for us, people like me need prints because I can't afford to have a, I can't afford a person like me. So you got to go with the print. And I couldn't afford me either. So prints are good. <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for your presentation, sir. Yes. Right, thank, sir. You. thank you. And everybody, please go to Matt's website and sign up for his newsletter. It would be great to get a free printable uh, bird painting, a JPEG. So uh, everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for taking the time, uh, Matt, to give us a presentation. It was great meeting you and take care. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you again. Okay, Thank everyone. You. See you next month and have a good evening. Bye bye. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, Matt.